Well, thank you so much. What a blessing it is to worship our God. If you would, take your Bibles and be turning to the book of Luke chapter 6 this morning. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. When you find your place, we'll begin reading in verse 37. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite, First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. Let's pray. Father, Lord, once again we come before your throne of grace. Father, we're so thankful to be able to look together in your word, to be able to read it, to hear it. God, you speak to us through it. Father, I just pray now that you would uh, use it in our lives this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In verse 36 of the same chapter, Jesus said, Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Uh, Throughout the past several weeks, I know we've had a couple of weeks where we've had something different go on, uh, but generally speaking for about the past month or so, we've been looking at the thought of kingdom love. In this Sermon on the Mount, in the Gospel of Luke, Christ preaches a sermon. And in this sermon, Christ really emphasizes on something specific. And that is, what is kingdom love? What it looks like? What it should look like in the life of a believer? How it unfolds itself? And that's what we've been looking at all the way since we've been reading in verse 27 till now. But anyway, we've seen several different points as we've been looking at this. We looked at the thought, um, who to love. And what the Bible tells us in verse 27, he says, Love your enemies, do good to those that hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Now as we've talked about it, and probably several times since we began this, that seems backwards to us. This seems to not make sense. This seems to be the exact opposite of how we want to react, and it is the exact opposite of how we want to react. This is not the kingdom of this world. This is not love according to the standards of the kingdom of this world, but this is what love is according to God's standards and in His kingdom. And this morning, church, if you've been saved, If you have repented from your sins and trusted Christ as your Savior, you are no longer or not primarily a citizen of this world. Though, of course, uh, this weekend we're celebrating Memorial Day weekend, tomorrow being Memorial Day. We're celebrating this time. Uh, We are uh, reminded of those who have gone before us, who have died in battle to uh, help us and to give us freedom. Well, we're thankful for that. But what the Christian, in our minds, our mind understands that there are people who died to give us freedom. But ultimately, there is a Savior who died to give us the ultimate spiritual freedom. He translated us, He changed us from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of His dear Son. We are a part of His kingdom. I'm thankful to be American, but more than being American today, I am a Christian, and that is where I'm going. I'm going to spend eternity with God because of my faith in Him. Not, uh, I'm not going to continue on to be an American. So anyway, we see that we are a part of the kingdom of God. Who do we love? We love our enemies. How do we love? He says, when someone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. Uh, 
If somebody takes something from you, uh, your cloak, give them your shirt as well. Uh, if anybody asks you, give them, give to them. So these are three ways that Christ tells us that we are to love and to display kingdom love. Uh, it is a selfless love, turning the other cheek. It is a sacrificial love, giving of ourselves. It is a sincere love because he also said, uh, love others as you want to be loved. Treat others as you wanted to be treated. So we looked at the thought of uh, who to love and then how to love. Then we looked at why love and we see the world loves people who does good to them. The world loves people who loves them. The world gives to people who gives to them. The world does for people who does for him. But we find that Jesus said, do love, help those who cannot and will not return that love. And this is why love. We love because Christ loved us. He says in verse 35, but love your enemies. Do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great. Your reward will be great. He also tells us that we were loved by the Most High, that He was kind to the ungrateful, that He was good to the evil. And then He says, Be merciful, as we've already read. Be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. Why should we display kingdom love? Because we are displaying the love of God. You see, we are sinners. We are sinners by birth and sinners by choice. I was speaking to a young man about this this week, uh, just during the week, and I was trying to explain to him that we are born in sin. Our parents were sinners. They gave birth to sinners, and then well, that's our nature is to sin. We know that, right? We know that our nature is, is sinners, and then when we get old enough, we begin to choose to sin when we understand things. That is our nature. That's what we are. And this young man kind of, he didn't want to accept that. He says, I don't like the fact that I'm just a sinner and there's nothing I can do about it. I want to be able to do something about it. I think we're all born innocent, we're all born good, and then because of our environment, he said, we begin to do things wrong. Well, that sounds all rosy and good, but that's not the picture that the Bible paints. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. That is speaking that from the very, early, the very earliest part of his birth, he was a sinner. He was infected by the nature of a sin that was passed on from his parents, that was passed on from their parents. We are sinners, and we are changed only by the love of God. We are, we are needy people. And God loved us when we were needy. God loved us when we were enemies. God loved us. He was merciful to us. He was kind to us. He was gracious to us. And we as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to display that love back to the world. We are to reflect the love of God to this world. That's what we're called to do. We have been placed into God's kingdom. Now we love with a kingdom love. Well, this morning I want to look at more on this thought. We're not going to be very long this morning. But I want us to look at the results of kingdom love. The results of kingdom love. Beginning in verse 37, he begins to say this. Of course, verse 36, be merciful even as your father is merciful. And then going on, really continuing in that line of thinking, he says, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. We're going to look at three things from this text this morning from uh, verse 37 down through verse 42. The three thoughts that we're going to look at on the results of kingdom love is we are slow to judgment slow to judgment because we love because we have the love of God because the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts we're slow to judgment we are quick to forgive and give and we are aware of our own sin those are the three things we're going to look at this morning first of all he says judge not and you will not be judged condemn not and you will not be condemned this is one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible you go back to Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that you be not judged, we say. We hear. And, and that is what the verse says. But we have this understanding. Our society has this understanding. And in a lot of ways, if you're not careful, we will take on society's understanding of that text and not the Scripture's understanding of that text. We will take on society's intent in, the, in that text and not God, the Holy Spirit's intent in that text. The Bible says, do not judge. The Bible says, judge not and you will not be judged. What in the world does that mean for us? What is the commandment? What is it telling us to do? First of all, I think we need to know what it's not telling us. 
We need to truly understand what it's not telling us. If you see this, he says, judge not, condemn not. But then later on in this text, before it's over, he says, take the log out of your eye so you can help your brother take the speck out of their eye. There is a call for the Christian to help people in life. There is a call for the Christian to be discerning. That's a good word that we need to know and understand, discerning. That's being able to tell the difference in right and wrong, to decipher between what God uh, approves and what he does not approve. The Christian is called to be discerning. And so anyway, we find even in the Matthew text where it says, do not judge. A little later on, he says, do not cast your pearls before the swine. He's calling on Christian to judge between the swine. Those are people wicked who are not going to, to accept, who are not going to bow to Christ. They are, they are uh, at odds with the gospel. And Jesus said, don't cast your pearl before the swine. So we are called to be discerning. Also, later on in this text, he's going to speak of the fruit of the righteous. If you're a good tree, uh, then the figure of speech in the parable. If you're a good tree, you're going to produce good fruit. If you're not a good tree, you're going to produce bad fruit. So we are called to understand that. And we are called to call that out, especially within the church. If we have a Christian brother, a Christian sister, that claims that have repented of their sins and trust Christ, yet they live in open, unrepentant sin, we are to call them out on that in love. We are to do that. But you see, so, so Christ is not saying not to judge in any fashion. He's talking a very, about a very specific form of judgment. And this is the judgment of the Pharisees, the judgment of the scribes. You see, what they would do is they had a law that they thought they lived out just right. It was a hard law. It was, it was taking God's law and then adding things to it. And they, they, they thought they were living it, living it just like they needed to be living it. And if they saw somebody that they thought was not doing how they thought they needed to do, they judged them and they condemned them. It was a blind judgment. If you don't line up to my life, then you're not right with God. If you don't dress how I think you should dress, you're not right with God. If you don't talk how I think you should talk, you're not right with God. If, if everything does not line up just so, then you are not living with God's favor on your life and you will be judged and you will be condemned because you do not meet up, you do not line up with my personal righteousness. That is a false judgment. That is an ungodly judgment. I think of the two men that went in the temple to pray. And the Bible talks about the Pharisee that went in and he lifted his eyes, he lifted his arm and he said, thank you God that I'm not like other sinners. Thank you that I'm not like, and the other man was a publican, a tax collector who knew he was in sin. Thank you that I'm not like this tax collector that's here. I, I fast twice a week. I do what you've told me to do. He was thanking God for how good he was. Ultimately, he was thanking himself. He wasn't praying to God. And he judged this man unfairly. He didn't know what was going on in his heart. He didn't know what was going on in his life. All the while, the publican was praying. He would not even so much as lift up his head, but he hit his chest, and he said, Oh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus asked the question, which one went away forgiven that day? It was the publican that confessed his sin, not the Pharisee who was praising himself. Jesus is warning in this text against that type of hypocritical and blind judgment that many times we can be guilty of. We can be too harsh in our judgment. We can be too quick in our judgment. Now again, this is not speaking of discernment. This is not speaking of helping our brother or sister to live for Christ. That's not what it's talking about. In the church of Christ, we are accountable to one another. We hear this a lot. Nobody uh, can tell me what to do. Nobody's my judge. Nobody's my boss. Or uh, it's nobody's business what I'm doing. If you have, we don't understand church membership when we say and think things like that. If you have joined yourself to a local church, if you have been saved, been baptized, been co come into the fellowship of a local church, you have made your life our business in some ways. Now, I'm not saying every little thing of your life, how you do business in your home. I'm referring to your public witness for Christ. I am accountable that if you do something for me to come alongside and to encourage you to do better, you are accountable to come to me if you see the same thing in my life. This is something we see taught plainly throughout the teachings of the epistles that we as the church of Christ are to help one another live for Christ. We are to be discerning. We are to be helpful to one another. We are not to judge blindly. 
We are not to judge harshly. We are not to judge hypocritically. So Jesus started off by saying, judge not and you will not be judged. Speaking of multiple types of judgment, if you judge the outside world unfairly, they're going to judge you unfairly. If you're unmerciful to them, they're going to be unmerciful to you. So be merciful, but also for our Father in heaven in his judgment against us. So judge not and condemn not. But then we see two other commandments here that he encourages us to do. Not only are we to be slow to judgment, we're also to be quick to forgive and to give. He says still in verse 37, he says, Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and will be given to you. And he goes on to describe what this giving will be like that we receive. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will fill, will be put into your lap. For with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. All right, here's what he's saying. First of all, he said, do not be judgmental uh, to, to people around you harshly and unfairly. And then he says, be forgiving. So here's what he's saying. If the God of the universe, who has the right, who has the ability and the right to judge us immediately, He is holy, we are unholy. He is perfect, we are imperfect. He is God, we are His enemies by nature. So if the God of the heaven has dealt with us mercifully, if He has dealt with us kindly and dealt with us compassionately, who are we as believers and recipients of the grace of God to deal with anybody else in a way that is not forgiving and giving? God has dealt with us. God was forgiving to us. We go back to the gospel and see Jesus Christ on the cross. He was uh, arrested unfairly and unjustly. He was tried. He was beaten. He was nailed to a cross. And while he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive those who are doing this to me. Forgive them. They know not what they do. His first response, one of his first responses on the cross was an act of forgiveness and mercy. He could have called the wrath of God down on these people, but he did not. Instead of calling God's wrath down, he called God's forgiveness down. He called God's mercy. While he was being mistreated, he treated others better than they were treating him. While he was being judged, he treated others with mercy. And that's what God, that's what the Lord Jesus calls on us to do today. We are to treat people mercifully because our God is merciful and because God has treated us mercifully. There is a parable that Jesus would tell the apostle Peter. Well, Peter, he would come to Christ and ask him how many times should he forgive someone who's done him wrong. Jesus, he said, should I forgive him seven times? Jesus said, no, I say not seven, but seven times 70. Uh, and there's discussion on what that means. It is, is it actually a multiplication problem or is Jesus just saying, don't stop forgiving? <laughs> Don't stop to think how many times you're forgiving. Just be forgiving. And then, then Jesus told a parable. He said, there was a servant who owed a great sum of money to his master. And it goes and describes this great sum of money. If it was for us today, this would be millions and millions of dollars that, that he owed his master that he could not pay. So he came before his master. And the master said, you need to pay me or you're going to be sent to jail. The servant fell to his knees. He begged, he pleaded, he said, I cannot pay it right now, but if you will give me time, I will try my hardest to pay it. The master of the Bible said he had compassion on his servant. He, his heart was broken for his servant. He said, you know what? I forgive you of your debt, this amazing debt, this unimaginably high debt that he owed his master. He was forgiven. He, the, the, the debt was wiped clean, paid in full, was stamped on it. He was rejoicing in his heart and rejoicing physically because he had been forgiven this great debt. And then he went out and you would think, boy, this man's going to go show compassion on somebody else because of what he received. But that's not what he did. He went to his servant, his or a fellow servant who owed him some money, where he owed his master millions and millions of dollars. It was just a couple of dollars if you would compare it to what we have today. He just, his, his friend owed him a couple of dollars. He said, pay me what you owe me. His friend said, I can't, but I'll give it to you later. And he took him by the throat. He cast him down and he said, I'm going to put you in prison because you can't pay me the couple of dollars you owe me. 
Uh, this is unthinkable. Other servants saw this. They went back to the master and they said, Master, you just forgave this servant this great sum, this great debt, and here's what he has gone out and, and has done. So they call, he calls the servant back to him and he, he, he tells him he knows what he's done and then he casts him into prison. He reinstates the debt. Then he casts him into prison. So we are called on because we have been forgiven such a great debt. We don't understand the depths of our sinfulness. We could compare it to the sum that the first servant owed. It's an unpayable debt. God is holy. God is absolutely perfect, absolutely holy in every way. And he demands holiness on his creation's part. Yet we are so unholy. We are ungodly. We were born in sin and now we choose to sin every day. It seems we can't help but sin. And we owe this massive debt to God that we cannot pay to Him. And God sent His Son to die for us to suffer the wrath of God against our sins on Himself. He suffered for the lies that you told. He suffered for the indiscretions. He suffered for the abuses. He suffered for the murders that took place. He suffered for all of these things. He absorbed the full brunt of the wrath of God on himself so that we could receive mercy. He took our sin so he, we would get his righteousness. He took the wrath of God so we would receive the grace of God. That's what he did for us. Who are we? to withhold forgiveness from anybody. It doesn't make sense. Just as scandalous as it was for that servant to not be forgiving, it is more scandalous. It is even more scandalous for us to not forgive those who mistreat us. It is scandalous for, for us to not forgive those who abuse us. It is unrighteous for us to withhold Forgiveness. Now I understand there are situations, there are circumstances in which you may need people, some people may need counseling because of the extent of abuse that they may have received. I'm not saying that the abusers don't need to be brought to justice. That is not what I nor the Word of God is saying today. If you are being abused physically in any way, that needs to be brought to the light. And that person needs to be brought to justice. However, if you hold something against them, and if you're holding this, this pain and this hurt in your heart, and you are not forgiving for what has been done, then you are not hurting that person. That person is not suffering one bit by your unforgiveness. You are suffering. So we are called upon to forgive as we have been forgiven. He also says to give. Giving to others. This is, again, as he's already described in the text above, this is giving to people who can't give back to us. This is giving to people who may even take from us. He says, give, forgive and give. And if you will give as we are commanded to give, God has forgiven us and God has given so much to us that we don't deserve and we can't give back to him. And if God's loved us in that way, we are called to love others as God loves. But there is a blessing for giving. Now, I don't know how it's going to come to you or how it's going to come to me. I don't, I'm not saying God's going to leave a bag of money on your front porch. That, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying you're going to find a new car parked in the garage in the morning. That's not the message we're preaching here. But what I am saying, in some way, God is going to bless you, maybe in a spiritual sense, maybe in a physical sense. But if you will be forgiving, if you will be giving, you will receive so much from God. And notice how he describes the giving, good measure. That's a full... What this is, and some of, some of you, I think I've heard Brother Gary describe this. Uh, he may can describe this even better than I can. But what this is, they would go to, to buy wheat or corn or something like that. And they would take their bag. And so, first of all, he says you will get a good measure. That's filling it up as high as it'll go. Filling your bag up. And then it says press down trying to remove any air pockets out of the bag so the whole bag can be filled and then they'll put more. And so not only do you receive a good measure, but you receive a good measure pressed down, shaken together. It's shaken down so any extra pieces or any extra room will be filled up and they put more again. And then to the point where it's filling over and spilling over into your lap. God is saying, I will bless you and you will not even be able to contain the blessing that I give you when you are forgiving and when you are giving to others. He will bless so we see that the results of kingdom love is we are not overly judgmental. We're not judgmental. Also, we are quick to forgive and quick to give. But also in verse 39 <clears throat> and then down to verse 42, we see two 
examples of, of us being aware of our sin. Number one, he tells the story of a blind man leading a blind man. There's this one blind man who thinks he knows where to go, so he takes the other blind man and leads him along. What happens? The ending result of the story is they both fall in the ditch because the blind man don't the first blind man don't know where he's going any more than the second blind man does. And so that's the story Jesus tells. We need to know something today that we're blind. We need to realize that we have a problem. We have we need to be aware of our sins. The second story he tells is about a man who goes and tries to take a speck of dust out of another man's eye. And there's a log sticking out of his eye. A huge piece of wood. And why in the world would a man with a huge piece of wood sticking out of his eye care about the, 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 the small thing that's in someone else's eye? Jesus tells both of these stories for this reason. We need to be aware of our sin. And something that kingdom love does for us is that we are made sensitive to our own failings. We're made sensitive to our own weaknesses. We're made sensitive to our own frailty. And that's important for the child of God. We do not need to be lifted up and to think that, oh, I've been saved. I'm a Baptist. I'm, an, I'm a part of a chunky Baptist church. I'm better than someone else. And I'm not saying anybody has this attitude, but we need to be careful that we never have that type of an attitude, that we never have the type of attitude that we think we're better than anybody for anything because we were once in the grip of sin, but we were given grace. We were given mercy. We were given the love of Christ and we were rescued out of our sin. You are not better than anybody on this earth. I am not better than anybody on this earth. We should see ourselves just as frail and just as able to fall as anyone else. So we know that it's God's grace that we stand. We know that it's by God's grace that we've not fallen. We know it's by God's grace that we are where we are today that if it were not for God's withholding hand and His grace that we could be somewhere strung out on the worst of things. We could be there if it were not for the grace of God. The only thing that separates us from anybody else who are, who's in that situation is we have by faith received God's grace but we don't need to look down on people we need to share the message of the gospel we need to be aware of our own sins we need to be aware of our own frailty because we need to be able to bring this message to the world they need to hear about the life changing life giving soul saving gospel of Jesus Christ they need to hear the fact that Jesus came to earth born of a virgin lived a perfect life that we could not live he died on the cross his perfect life was then placed on our account and we have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ through his death on the cross and we receive this by repenting of our sins and placing our faith in Christ alone this is how we are saved this this is how we are made new. And this is how anybody on this earth can be saved. It's by the message of the gospel. Paul would write, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe on him. Uh, uh, the, the Philippian jailer who was a pagan came to Paul and said, What must I do to be saved? Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It is by the gospel, it is by the life of Christ that we can be saved, the life and death of Christ that we can be saved. It's all about Him. We add nothing to it. All we add to this thing is our sin, and Christ gets rid of that. You add nothing to your relationship with Christ. He is the Savior. Salvation is entirely of Him, and it's all from Him and by Him and to Him. We need to be aware. And kingdom love makes us well aware of our sin. To where when we pray, we don't say, Oh, God, thank you that I'm not like everybody else. We say, oh God, thank you for being merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, would you be merciful to these other people? Would you be merciful to, 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 to this person or to that person? God, would you be merciful to those on the mission field who need to be saved? God, would you be merciful to them as you are merciful to me? And we show mercy as well from our lives. We have been brought into the kingdom of God. We are citizens of the kingdom. Let's live out our citizenship in love. Let's pray. Father... Lord, we come before you in the precious name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for loving us. 
God, thank you for showing mercy to me. What I deserved was hell. What I deserved was your wrath and hatred against sin. But instead of that, I received grace and mercy and pardon. Father, that I did not deserve. So, Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts that we could be not judgmental, that we could be forgiving and giving, and we would always be aware of our frailties so we can look to you for grace. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.